This is part 8 of Dawson, a series on the evolution of a fictional New England mill city utilizing real history. Last episode, we talked about xenophobia and the beginning of the economic decline in Dawson. If you haven't listened to that, I recommend doing so. If you already have or just like to listen out of order, then welcome to the show. This is Dawson. first chapter of the book Crabgrass Frontier by Kenneth Jackson begins with a quote from the ancient world, quote, Our property seems to me the most beautiful in the world. It is so close to Babylon that we enjoy all the advantages of the city. And yet, when we come home, we are away from all the noise and dust. Written in cuneiform on a clay tablet, this letter to the king of Persia in 539 BC represents the first extant expression of the suburban ideal." End quote. As long as cities have existed, humans have had the desire to leave them and live in the countryside. There is no greater example of that than the suburbs of the modern era. In 1949, then-President Harry Truman announced the Fair Deal during his State of the Union address. It was intended to be a continuation of Roosevelt's New Deal. The Fair Deal proposed many things, such as advancing the civil rights movement, creating a universal health care program, expansion of social welfare, and other bills. One of the more well-known products of the Fair Deal was the Housing Act of 1949. In post-war America, almost every city was losing population to the suburbs. The suburbs promised a countryside-inspired utopia, away from the noise, pollution, and the slums in the heart of the cities. Even just after the Industrial Revolution, industrialized nations have attempted to synthesize the rural vistas of the pre-industrial era. One example being Long Island, New York, during the turn of the 20th century, where industrialists who made their fortunes off the Gilded Age built sprawling estates reminiscent of European castles just like West and East Eggs in The Great Gatsby. This ideology was most recognizable in the Garden City movement at the turn of the 20th century. Developed by urban planner Ebenezer Howard in 1898, this concept drove to combine city life with the countryside environment. This turned out to be successful as many garden cities were built and still exist to this day, such as Greenbelt, Maryland, Mount Royal, Quebec, Christchurch, New Zealand, and Letchworth Garden City, England. Suburbs after the Second World War attempted to be the derivative to the suburbs of the Garden City movement. In order to handle the influx of veterans from the Second World War who wanted to start families, the post-war suburb was developed with support of the GI Bill. The design for the post-war suburb was to, above all things, accommodate the private automobile. The dream would be that the businessman of America would live in a mass-manufactured house and drive to his office in the city. The first example of the mass-manufactured post-war suburb is Levittown on Long Island, New York, which was built between 1947 and 1951. The houses in Levittown were wood and were generic versions of vernacular architecture. Author and social critic James Howard Kunstler, who we quoted last episode, describes in his book The Geography of Nowhere, quote, As the outside world became more of an abstraction, and the outside of the house lost its detail, it began to broadcast information about itself and its owners in the abstracted language of television, specifically of television advertising, which is to say, a form of communication based on simplification and lies. As in television advertising, the lies have to be broad and simple because the intended audience is a passing motorist who will glance at the house for a few seconds. So, one dwelling has a fake little cupola to denote vaguely an image of rusticity, 
Another has a fake portico a la Gone with the Wind, with skinny, two-story white columns out of proportion with the mass of the house, and a cement slab too narrow to put a rocking chair on, hinting at wealth and gentility. A third has a plastic pediment over the door and brass carriage lamps on either side, invoking tradition. The intent is to create associations that will make the house appear as something other than the raised ranch it actually is, something better, older, more enduring, resonant with history and taste. Americans wonder why their houses lack charm. The word charm may seem fuzzy, trivial, and vague. I use it to mean explicitly that which makes our physical surroundings worth caring about. It is not a trivial matter, for we are presently suffering on a massive scale the social consequences of living in places that are not worth caring about. Charm is dependent on connectedness, on continuities, on the relation of one thing to another. Kunstler continues, The mobility that Americans prize so highly is the final ingredient in the debasement of housing. The freedom to pick up and move is a premise of the national experience. It is the physical expression of the freedom to move upward socially, absent in other societies. The automobile allowed this expression to be carried to absurd extremities. Our obsession with mobility, the urge to move on every few years, stands at odds with the wish to endure in a beloved place, and no place can be worthy of that kind of deep love if we are willing to abandon it on a short notice for a few extra dollars. Rather, we choose to live in no place, and our dwellings show it. In every corner of the nation, we have built places unworthy of love, and move on from them without regret. But move on to what? Where is the ultimate destination when every place is no place? End quote. No place. A word Kunstler uses for the suburban developments in post-war America. These developments had big streets lined with houses produced with an assembly line method. The goal was not quality, but to crank out as many industrial produced boxes as quickly as they could. It was not long ago that the home was a multi-generational thing, part of the family as much as anyone was. Now, it was a product to be consumed. These developments gobbled up land and turned vegetation into grabgrass, streets, and driveways. Accommodating the automobile, it moved people further and further away from the city, creating a need for cars even more so than before. To deal with the drastic rise in car usage, cities were decimated to build highways, parking lots, garages, and infrastructure to accommodate cars. Urban renewal. This could all be done with the Housing Act of 1949. Section 1 of the Act authorized federal funds for slum clearance. The term urban renewal was a marketing term. In order to renew the city, the city government would define general areas as slums, with the definition loosened as much as the city government wanted. In some cases, these areas were actually areas of abandoned buildings in disrepair, but more often than not, the definition for a slum was any low-income area, even if the buildings were well-maintained. In many cases, often in larger metropolitan areas, neighborhoods with predominantly black residents were declared slums by the city government, and just by that, they were granted federal funds to demolish them. An article from political magazine called How a 19th Century Town Became a New Millennium Marvel outlines the very same issue that Manchester, New Hampshire had during our era. Quote, Manchester, New Hampshire, convinced that manufacturing would return if the district's physical conditions were improved, chose a middle path. During the 60s, its federally funded urban renewal project filled in the canals and knocked down the smaller, curving brick buildings that ran alongside them to create wide roadways and parking lots. Legenbach denounced the plan, arguing architectural treasures were being destroyed when regulating traffic flow and building some parking garages would achieve the same purposes. City officials were unimpressed. Bunk, we are not destroying any monument. 
We're giving it a lease on life by clearing away the junk. Urban Renewal Director Kerry P. Davis told Manchester's Union Leader, What is mainly being leveled is nothing but a lot of rickety rat's nests and fire traps. John Holbin returned to his hometown to take over as city coordinator in 1972, just as the Urban Renewal Project was being completed. By then, all the companies they were anticipating would use the space were either gone to suburban single-story manufacturing structures that were far more functional or efficient for them, or had left New England altogether, he recalls. They'd done something starkly cheap and utilitarian at the time, when industry didn't want that anymore. I remember standing in what is now Arms Park with a couple other people, and looking out over this huge, cavernous parking lot without a job in sight, he says. We saw that something wasn't working here. End quote. Some cities that Dawson is based off of were destroyed by urban renewal. Just like how Manchester, New Hampshire's canals were filled in and paved with parking lots, in Lowell, the immigrant neighborhoods were decimated. In Waterville, Half of downtown was destroyed and replaced with a strip mall. In Dawson, some canals were filled and paved over, and the Little Canada neighborhood, parts of downtown, and a few mills were destroyed. While suburbanization wreaked havoc on the urban fabric of Dawson, the economy tanked from the continued mill closures. People began moving away from the city because the city center was associated with poverty and uncleanliness. One of the environmental factors was waste dumped into the river. One of the most polluted rivers in America during the 60s was the Androscoggin River in Lewiston and Brunswick. An article from the Sun Journal titled Androscoggin River, once full of toxic chemicals, now clear after 45 years of Clean Water Act, says, quote, Watch the Androscoggin River today as it flows down from the Great Falls at Lewiston, Auburn, and it seems scarcely believable that it was once little more than an open sewer, full of toxic chemicals, a channel for every throwaway thing that could be swept to the sea. Half a century ago, state fisheries biologist Dick Anderson got the revolting task of surveying reeking waters between Bethel and Brunswick to see whether any game fish remained. With the exception of few reasonably pristine tributaries, he said he found only billows of foam floating here and there, and pipes pouring vowel gunk into the water. He didn't find fish, but he learned that ducks and muskrats love sewage. Anderson said he could tell the color of tissue paper when paper mill in Mechanic Falls was pumping out each day because the river beside it would take on the same shade from the excess dye. One slaughterhouse would flush all its waste into the river at the end of each working day, he said. It was so bad that the Androscoggin and the Kennebec and Penobscot rivers as well were cited by the growing environmental movement in the 1960s as among the 10 most polluted waterways in the country. Some said the Androscoggin was the most polluted river in America. End quote. Then Maine Senator Edmund Munsky, who grew up in Rumford on the Androscoggin River, was inspired by the river's condition and drafted up a bill which would become the Clean Water Act of 1972. This act established the foundation for pollution discharge regulation, meaning that rivers across the United States and in the New England mill cities would no longer be dumps for waste. In 1956, a landmark act was passed by the name of the Federal Aid Highway Act of 1956, or more commonly known as the National Interstate and Defense Highways Act. This will go down in history as America's largest public works program. By taking funding from the federal defense budget, a nationwide network of controlled access highways was constructed. Dwight Eisenhower was inspired by his 1919 cross-country convoy on the unfinished Lincoln Highway in the Army. The Lincoln Highway at the time had potholes and so much mud that sometimes they would have to push the vehicles out. Also inspired by the effect that the Audubon had on the German army during the Second World War, he introduced the Interstate Project in 1954. He writes in his book, Addie's Stories I Tell to Friends, quote, After seeing the Autobahns of modern Germany and knowing the asset those highways were to the Germans, 
I decided, as president, to put an emphasis on this kind of road building. The old convoy had started me thinking about good two-lane highways, but Germany had made me see the wisdom of broader ribbons across the land. End quote. The interstate highway was envisioned by Eisenhower to be for military defense in the case of an invasion, but would be used for civilian passengers and freight. Over the next decades, the interstate system would be under construction around the nation, finishing construction officially in 1992. In Dawson, it is Interstate 98. It runs from Lincoln, New Hampshire, through the mountains to Conway, and then comes into the Amasek Valley from the northwest and leaves in the southeast to meet with Interstate 295 in Scarborough, Maine. In Dawson, a spur is constructed called Interstate 198 to funnel traffic into the city center, and several other controlled access highways are built on the main state route numbering system. These spurs into city centers were often combined with taking advantage of the Housing Act of 1949. City governments would often demolish blocks of city centers in order to build highways with mostly federal funding in the name of urban renewal. The effect that the interstate had on the United States cannot be overstated. Freight could be moved more efficiently than ever before. That combined with the entrenched idea that every American had to consume and buy as much as they could to revive the post-war economy created an unprecedented consumer culture. Noticing the suburbanization of the United States, architect Victor Gruen capitalized on this. Gruen was born in Austria and moved to the United States after the German invasion of Austria in 1938. During his time in the United States, he considered the individual store format common in American downtowns inefficient. While practicing architecture, Gruen put his ideals into a place that he felt challenged America's rising car fanaticism, called the Southdale Shopping Center. This was the first enclosed shopping center in America. Gruen pictured it to be a complete social gathering place, and would eventually have residences, schools, and even medical centers. However, that never ended up being so. In Gruen's own words, it would, quote, provide the needed place and opportunity for participation in modern life that the ancient Greek agora, the medieval marketplace in our town squares, provided in the past, end quote. Southdale Center was very successful, and not long after its development, shopping malls based on it were built all around the country, including White. In 1978, Gruen later denied the title of Father of the Shopping Mall, quote, I am often called the Father of the Shopping Mall. I would like to take this opportunity to disclaim paternity once and for all. I refuse to pay alimony to those bastard developments. They destroyed our cities. End quote. Even the famous architect Frank Lloyd Wright said when it first opened, quote, The Garden Court has all the evils of the village street and none of its charm. Gruen should have left downtown, downtown. End quote. Shopping malls took away commerce from the local economy downtown, and many times family owned shops had to close because of the loss of business from the national corporate chains in the malls. As a result of these shopping centers opening, the local economies deteriorated even more. Prior to the shopping mall, large department chains like Woolworths were established in downtowns of cities. In the early 1960s, several of these department store chains looked toward the suburbs and saw what places like Southdale Shopping Center did and experimented with a new format of store. Many of these suburban chains were rebrands of the popular downtown chains. Woolworths created Woolco, and Dayton's created Target. Many more chains kept their branding when moving to the suburbs, such as J.C. Penney, Sears, and Walmart. In an NPR interview, historian Mark Levinson describes the rise of these suburban big-box chain stores, quote, in 1962, a number of different companies decided to try and create brand new store formats. The leader in that, in 1962, is forgotten today. It was a company called Woolworths, and it opened a store called Woolco, 
Wolko was expected to be the giant because Woolworths was gigantic, and everyone thought Wolko was going to conquer the world. Wolko, as your listeners know, didn't make it. He continues, One of the prerequisites for the big box was the car. Everybody had to have a car because the big box was sitting out in a parking lot somewhere. The big box made shopping into a family experience. Mom and dad and the kids all piled into the car. They went out to this big store and they could spend several hours there because there was, by the standards of the day, an enormous amount of merchandise. Now, you've got to give people a little sense of scale. We are talking about stores that were gigantic for their time, and that meant they might have about 50,000 square feet of space. If you go into a typical Walmart supercenter today, it's perhaps four times that size, so big is relative. But for its day in 1962, these stores were quite large. Levinson also mentioned why the discount store was so popular after World War II. There were laws meant to prohibit big retailers from getting volume discounts. They couldn't buy merchandise more cheaply than mom and pop stores and mark it down. The other thing was that the manufacturer could make a product, could tell the retailer, you may sell our good, but only at the price we set. And so if a retailer wanted to sell a certain brand of camera or a certain phonograph record or whatever, it had to sell it at the price set. That started breaking down in the 1950s and that really opened the way to discount retailing." End quote. In mid-century America, a new architectural movement was gaining traction. The suburban shopping centers let architects flex their muscles to try out this new movement on a large scale, modernism. Modernist architecture was part of the modernist movement that began as a philosophical rebuttal against certainty, adornment, and truth which many felt traditional architecture and ideals embodied. Modernism highlighted the abstract and social uncertainty in the years after the First World War. Modernist architecture was a very plain style without any ornaments, and after the Second World War, many architects and clients realized that using the style would bring the design cost down. Author James Howard Kunstler describes it, quote, Modernism did its immense damage in these ways. By divorcing from the practice of building, from the history and traditional meanings of building. By promoting a species of urbanism that destroyed age-old social arrangements and, with them, urban life as a general proposition. And by creating a physical setting for man that failed to respect the limits of scale, growth, and the consumption of natural resources. Or to respect the lives of other living things. The result of modernism, especially in America, is a crisis of the human habitat. Cities ruined by corporate giganticism and abstract renewal schemes. Public buildings and public spaces unworthy of human affection. Vast sprawling suburbs that lack any sense of community. Housing that the unrich cannot afford to live in. Slavish obeisance to the needs of automobiles and their dependent industries at the expense of human needs. And a gathering ecological calamity that we have only begun to measure. End quote. The Dawson State Normal College also takes advantage of the cheap modernist architecture and, just in time, as they merge into the state university system. They are renamed to the University of Maine at Dawson. The campus is expanded in the modernist style. Federal government subsidies for urban renewal and highway construction created infrastructure obesity in the city. Because downtown Dawson remained mostly dense, even with the effect of urban renewal, it wasn't car friendly. So White and Stanford benefited from that by transforming their rural countryscape into suburban developments. Over half of downtown White was raised and replaced with automobile friendly development. Where there was once farmland is now suburban sprawl. Local real estate developers purchased farmland outside of the town for cheap. They then built cheap cookie cutter single family houses and sold it at immense profits as people took out mortgages, a practice that still goes on today. As manufacturers continue shutting their doors, the economy tanks, and as the city sees a rise in crime and violence, the suburban lifestyle seems attractive to many people. This had a profound impact on ethnic communities, 
many of which were being raised anyway for urban renewal. In their denser urban neighborhoods, the cultural web was strong. Because these little Canada's and other ethnic neighborhoods, your fellow Franco-American was only a stone's throw away. The same goes for cultural hubs, with the newspapers, schools, family stores, and churches. When the ethnic communities move to the suburbs, these places are not as easy to go to. Where it used to be a short walk, now it's getting in the car and waiting in traffic. The suburbs allowed for the cultural webs to tear, and the assimilation of Franco-Americans to American culture began. And quickly, speaking French became unpopular and something that was looked down on. The baby boomer generation was the first generation to culturally assimilate en masse, and English slowly became the language of choice. Television made this easy. You could watch commercials and sitcoms all day, and you would learn English from that. The assimilation of Franco-Americans is reflective of a nationwide phenomenon, and its impact lasts to this day. Thank you. 
Thanks for watching or listening to the eighth episode of Dawson. If you like this, please consider subscribing so you can be the first to know when episode 9 drops, and leave a like to show your support. You can follow me on Instagram and Twitter at the handle unnamed with Matt, on a brand new subreddit r slash unnamed narrative, and if you would like to get in touch with me directly, you can email me at unnamednarrative at gmail.com.